Hi, I'm Hal Roberts. This is Bridge City News. Here's some of the top stories we've been following. Many residents across southwestern Alberta woke up to a huge blanket of white on Monday. The snowfall warning continues from Environment Canada. Students in Ontario will be headed back to classes on Tuesday as the Ford government and QB head back to the bargaining table. And the Operation Christmas Child campaign is underway. We hear from Samaritan Spurs about what some of the biggest needs are for this year's shoebox campaign. Your nation, your province, your southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Roberts. Thanks so much for joining us. A lot of southwestern Alberta has been walloped by snow. Environment Canada issued a snowfall warning for our region and says the heavy snow should continue in not only Lethbridge but also Medicine Hat and Calgary. The weather agency expects another 10 to 25 centimeters of the white stuff to fall again tonight. The highest snowfall amounts are forecast along Highway 1 corridor and in the south. Jeanette Rocher is in now with an early peak of the forecast. Jeanette, when can we really expect the snow to finally taper off? Well, Hal, it is an absolute whiteout out there. And uh, to answer your question, Lethbridge should see those light periods of snow ending this evening, but then starting up again overnight. We're looking at a 30% chance of flurries and, of course, an overnight low of minus 25. But with that wind chill, going to feel more like minus 32 and a risk of frostbite. No surprise there. Into Tuesday morning, starting out sunny, but then a 30% chance of flurries by the afternoon. Uh, minus 18. That's going to be the coldest day of the week. Going to feel colder with the wind. And chill by Tuesday evening though clear skies and it should be clear skies for the rest of the week. I'll be back later in the show with that seven day forecast as well as a look at the national weather. Clear skies we can only hope. Thanks so much Jeanette. A Lethbridge not-for-profit agency says they're in dire need of donations especially with a big dump of snow we received overnight. Streets Alive Missions Pin Bank which offers clothing to our most vulnerable is lacking in some very essential items to help many during the cold winter months. Jesse Tabor, supervisor for the Pin Bank, says they're already going through items fairly quickly. We need jackets, boots, um, any kind of winter type sweaters, thick stuff, socks, toques. We need kind of a little bit of everything right now just because it's everybody's needing it right now. We're getting that quick dump of snow here that's starting it off really quick here. So. Tracy Horvat, assistant director of mission operations, says besides the clothing bank, those who visit Streets Alive have other ways of keeping warm while it's cold outside. As it gets colder, people are going to come and they're going to stay because we're one of the only places they can just kind of come in and hang out all day. We've got usually a movie running to keep everybody entertained and kind of settled. Uh, we keep coffee, hot chocolate, tea, that kind of stuff going all day as well. Um, they can access all the little warm things upstairs too, uh, hand warmers, gloves. Anyone who's interested in donating to the mission can get in contact with them online, by phone, or by dropping off donations in person. Well, here in Lethbridge, our only shelter has been full and over capacity during the past few nights due to the extreme cold weather. Staff from the Alpha House Society say they do not turn away any homeless who are in need. They're also currently in talks to have the Blood Tribe Department of Health take over operations of the shelter. That is still the plan um, for the service provision grant to be transferred to the Blood Tribe Department of Health. Um, that would be uh, transitioning in January, so still a little bit of time until then. Um, and, you know, discussions are ongoing about the best way to make that transition as seamless as possible for folks on the street. Staff from Alpha House say you can donate winter coats, boots and sweatpants at the shelter for our city's most vulnerable to use during the cold winter months. Staff say personal hygiene items are also currently in need. Some of the numbers are rolling in from the advance voting in the Brooks Medicine Ad by-election. This is the riding where Premier Daniel Smith is hoping to secure a seat. Elections Alberta said just over 4,200 of the 34,000 eligible voters cast their ballots, which is just over 12% of eligible votes. That is in contrast to 2019, when over 7,500 voters participated in advance polls during the last provincial election. The by-election comes after former MLA Michaela Fry announced that she would not run a next May's provincial election and gave up her seat last month. Bob Leone is one of the candidates running in the riding. He's representing the Independence Party of Alberta and he joins us now from Medicine Hat. Bob, you have some pretty stiff competition with Premier Smith and former Brooks Mayor Barry Morishita, who's running for the Alberta Party. What do you bring to the table? I've been uh, traveling across Alberta here 
over the last two years, probably put on about 200,000 kilometers. I have spoken with many, many people across this province. Um, I'm not done yet. I'm trying to get a better understanding of where they're at with the situation we just went through. This travesty, as I called the last 35 months or whatever it's been. I bring, uh, I hope I bring a good sense of where Albertans are today. Um, I bring a lot of business experience. I've been a successful business owner in Alberta, in Northern Alberta for many decades. I come from very humble beginnings. I understand what it's like to be without and to fight for uh, opportunity and prosperity. So what do you say to those who don't want to vote for your party because it's a separatist party who many would argue really wants to break up Canada? So I've never been that separatist guy, ever. And I, you know, even though when I walked away from the UCP, I was really involved in the UCP in Northern Alberta. And I mean, meetings with Kenny, meetings with his chief of staff, meeting with many ministers, MLAs. I was so glad I did that. When I walked away um, from that political organization, there was a concern amongst the UCP then of this separatist movement, they called it. And it was new to me. And then I learned of the power of holding a referendum. It is, this is how I say it, how it's a conversation for Albertans to have. Quebec has had two of them. Although, although they weren't successful, technically, they were successful. They gained a lot of their power back. So what I say to people is, you know, be open to this idea of having this conversation because what I wish to have today more than ever before is to have a successful referendum card in my hand. And then we can say to Ottawa, to Trudeau, please have a seat. We would like to talk to you. We would like to talk to you about you, how you policy locked our prosperity. That's the power this brings. And I tell you what, people very quickly understand the, uh, the meaning of this conversation. Thanks so much for your time, Bob. That was Bob Leon, the Independence Party of Alberta candidate running in the Brooks Medicine Hat riding. And by the way, results from the by-election should be known on Tuesday night. The Trudeau government is going to be boosting federal health transfers to the provinces and territories, but there are some conditions attached. Health Minister Jean-Yves Duclos says the money will flow if the ministers agree to commit to building a world-class health data system for our country. When the premiers met in July, they asked Ottawa to increase health transfers from 22 to 35 percent funding. Duclos says the federal government will not engage in a futile fight on percentage points and transfers. Ontario's premier and a top minister do not have to testify at the Emergencies Act inquiry in Ottawa. A federal court judge has decided that parliamentary privilege affords both Doug Ford and Sylvia Jones immunity from testifying. Meanwhile, the mayor of Windsor, Ontario, is testifying at the public inquiry. Drew Dilkins spoke about evidence submitted to the commission showing exchange text with public safety minister Marco Menencino, who wanted the mayor's support for any additional authorities to keep the Ambassador Bridge open. Protesters opposed to the COVID-19 mandates blocked the bridge back on February the 7th. The Windsor-Detroit link, the busiest border crossing between Canada and the United States, was not reopened until a court injunction was served on February the 14th. Protest sites will be coming down across Ontario after Ontario Premier Doug Ford promised to rescind legislation against the ability of 55,000 education workers to strike and return to the bargaining table. CUPE says members will be returning back to school beginning on Tuesday. Premier Ford says it's important to get students back into the classroom. Well, we just want QP to be at the table. Uh, they walked away from the table. We had no option but to use Section 33 to keep the kids in the classroom. That's my, not, my only priority right now, is to make sure the kids are in the classroom after almost two and a half years of disruption on their physical, mental, and emotional health. They want to be with their friends in the classroom learning. I hear it every single day from kids. I hear it from parents. We need the kids back in classroom. We will negotiate fairly, but it's up to QP. They're the only ones that can do this. The Canadian Union of Public Employees rejected a deal from the province on October 30th and issued a five-day strike notice as part of a legal requirement. A member of the Canadian military, Captain Eric Chong, has died in Iraq in what the Department of National Defence described as non-operational related circumstances. 
Defence officials say an operations officer with 38 Canadian Brigade Group headquartered in Winnipeg died on Saturday in Baghdad. An investigation is underway and there are no details so far on what happened. The Lethbridge Salute Our Veterans banner project was a huge success this year. A total of 80 banners were raised high above the city and displayed in our city in different places like City Hall, the Cenotaph, the Legion and our city's airport. The banners featured a picture of a veteran and some information to showcase where they served and during which time period. Glenn Miller, a committee member for the project, says they're hoping to up that number to 90 banners by next year to include a variety of veterans from different wars in our history. There are a number of people from Lethbridge who served in the Boer War, and that's a war that you know nobody knows about anymore, but it's just as important. And so we would like to include a uh, representation of that. Um, and women, uh, there are women up there as well. So we, we try to get the diversity of those who served be reflective in the banners. The Legion's poppy campaign also began on October the 28th. Officials say the goal is to raise $90,000 this year to be distributed to veterans here in our city. The veteran banners will be on display in Lethbridge until the end of Remembrance Day. An incident of road rage over the weekend led to an assault on a woman in Lethbridge. Police say she was followed to her home in the 1500 block of 29th Street South by a man who confronted her after she allegedly cut him off in traffic. The man pulled up to her house in a blue sedan and opened her driver's side door and then grabbed her wrists. That's when, according to police, she blared on her horn to attract attention. The man then allegedly ran back to his car and drove away. The suspect is described by Lethbridge police as a Caucasian male, 30 years of age and possibly having a French accent. Anyone who has information on the incident can contact the LPS at 403-328-4444. This Sunday will be the last day Lethbridge residents will be able to drop off their yard waste at three different depot locations. The city says the depots are closing for the season as of November the 14th. The sites, including the Bridge Drive West location and the Stafford Drive North Recycling Station, have been open since the spring. Items that are welcome include everything from gutted pumpkins from Halloween, grass clippings and garden waste. The city's recycling centres, however, will remain open year-round. Children in West Africa, Central America and now Ukraine are set to receive some much-needed blessings in the form of a shoebox. Operation Christmas Child is now well underway. Video journalist Micah Quinn has the story on the annual campaign by the Christian Relief Organization Samaritan's Purse. And now you can pack a shoebox for a child half a world away. Last year, 413,000 shoeboxes were packed to be given out to children in need, and Samaritan's Purse is hoping to meet or exceed that number this year. Frank King, the news media relations manager for Samaritan's Purse Canada, says that packing a shoebox is quick and easy, and there are specific items you can include inside. We're looking for uh, uh, school supplies, hygiene items, and toys. So those are the three things we always love to see uh, in the shoeboxes. All of the shoeboxes are then transported to Calgary, where thousands of volunteers inspect each one and get them ready to be shipped out. Once all that's done, all the shoeboxes are packed in cartons and they're shipped out of the Calgary warehouse to those countries, So, which usually means like airplane and boat and sometimes, you know, in some countries, camels even, and, and canoes, and whatever it takes. Since 1993, Operation Christmas Child has collected and distributed almost 200 million shoebox gifts in more than 100 countries. Here in Lethbridge, shoeboxes can be dropped off at Fresh Life Church and Park Meadows Baptist Church from November 14th to the 20th during National Shoebox Collection Week. For more information on Operation Christmas Child, you can visit SamaritansPurse.ca. Forbridge City News. Uh, Micah Quinn. Hay River and a nearby First Nation community in the Northwest Territories experienced some of the worst flooding on record back in May. It resulted in the evacuation of a number of communities and caused more than $174 million in damage to homes and infrastructure. Months later, the town is still grappling to recover and to rebuild not only some of the housing in the community, but also its economy. We closed down, the whole community closed down for a week. Um, the downtown area, specifically this area right here, Capitol Drive, um, was they're still being affected. A number of the buildings are still not even open. But yeah, it's still something that everybody's still dealing with and still trying to rebound from. Um, but yeah, just the five or so buildings that are around here, I believe, with, well, three of the four are, aren't, aren't even actually open yet and uh, providing any services. So yeah, it's been devastating for sure. But there is a pretty immediate response. Uh, a lot of 
local and non-local businesses did come uh, right away uh, from Yellowknife, from Alberta. You'd seen just uh, community members and groups and organizations going bus uh, basement to basement, just helping tear out and do things like that. So it's pretty exciting to see, and I was able to help out a little bit with that. Just right beside us is the Whispering Willows, and that's seniors. I don't know how many units they have, but uh, it's still closed. I mean, there's right now a, an extreme shortage of housing in here, for sure. Overseas, the war between Russia and Ukraine has now entered its ninth month. Is there any end in sight? Our foreign affairs expert, Lisa Daftari, says there are intelligence reports by the Biden administration that there is internal pressure in both Ukraine and Russia to hold peace talks. They are trying to pressure Ukraine uh, Zelensky to uh, reportedly at least make it uh, look like they are working towards peace talks. They want this to come around, perhaps because we're about to have elections here this week, or um, who knows why, but they want the, uh, again, this is a, a report, um, so we don't have any uh, true uh, confirmation on this from either side, but um, the report says that U.S. Intel uh, says that they want the, the Ukrainians to at least look like or at least come towards the idea of having peace talks. Our foreign affairs expert Lisa Daftari will have more on the war in Ukraine coming up in the second half of our newscast. Well, there are reports that pro-Russian forces have been closing churches and arresting pastors in areas now under their control. Occupying forces have closed down the three largest evangelical Protestant churches in Ukraine. We have more now from Andrew Boyd from the UK-based Release International. Churches are being closed and pastors arrested in Russian-occupied Ukraine. Russian troops raided Melitopol's Grace Baptist Church while a worship service was underway. That service was being streamed live while the troops moved in. According to Associates of Release International, they entered the sanctuary, halted the worship service, registered the names of all present, and detained several ministers. The occupiers closed down the church and gave the pastor just 48 hours to get out of the city. Occupation forces have also shut down the city's largest Protestant church, Melitopol Christian Church, which has a thousand-seat auditorium. They tore down its cross and turned the building into a cultural and sports entertainment complex. In Mariupol, armed soldiers, their faces hidden by masks, detained a Baptist pastor and his wife. Neighbours described hearing groans and cries as they were taken away. In Crimea and other occupied territories, pro-Russian forces have raided places of worship, closed churches, fined people for leading worship meetings, and forced religious communities to re-register with the state, refusing that re-registration to the vast majority. Ukrainian Christians have been here before. They're being driven back to the underground churches of the Soviet era. Yet the message of history should be clear to Russia. The Christian faith has survived 70 years of Soviet totalitarian rule. And it thrives today in China under similar conditions. Persecution, terrible though it is, can only strengthen the church. This is Andrew Boyd for the Global News Alliance. Well, praying for the people of Ukraine and that that war comes to an end very soon. Many have also been praying for the snow to end here in our region. The heavy snowfall warning continued for Lethbridge today and more snow is on the way. Complete weather details are coming up. Well, my back is sore from all of the shoveling over the past couple of days. The white stuff may be sticking around just a little bit longer. Jeanette Roche is now with all of the weather details. Jeanette, the snowfall warning continued for our region today. Yes, it has, Hal. Uh, Southern Alberta is still expecting another 10 to 25 centimeters of snow overnight. Into Tuesday, though, Lethbridge is looking at many, mainly sunny skies earlier in the day. Then we're going to see another 30% chance of those flurries. 
minus 18 the high. It is going to be the chilliest day of the week. Um, so I guess that's the good news is that warmer temperatures are coming. However, uh, risk of frostbite, also a wind chill warning as well. It's minus 16 the high on Wednesday with beautiful sunny skies. Those skies are going to clear up and stay that way. And the temperature is going to get warmer. As I mentioned, minus 8 the high for Thursday, minus 3 for Friday. And uh, look at that weekend ahead of us. Zero degrees on both Saturday and Sunday with a mix of sun and cloud. I would say that that is perfect weather for hitting those ski hills. That way it's not too cold and you still got lots of snow. Perfect. The average, uh, the almanac tells us that the average high for this time of year is 6 degrees. Average low minus 522. That was our high temperature on this day back in 1999. And in 1973, it was the chilliest, which was minus 27. 730 is the when the sun rose this morning, sunset this evening, now at 5 o'clock instead of 6 o'clock because of those the time change there. So giving us exactly nine and a half hours of daylight. It's just happening a little bit sooner now. That's all. Victoria and Vancouver both looking at wet flurries mixed with showers tomorrow. Seven the high in Victoria, six the high in Vancouver tomorrow. High of uh, minus 16 tomorrow in Edmonton with snow. Calgary minus 16 also looking at another 10 centimeters of snow this evening as they are under a snowfall warning. Uh, sunshine tomorrow in Calgary though. Saskatoon, one degree, also looking at another 10 centimeters this evening as they are also under a snowfall warning. Uh, we're looking at rain mixed up with flurries tomorrow, showers expected tomorrow in Regina, minus five the high, and four degrees the high tomorrow in Winnipeg with a mix of sun and cloud. Now, mainly clear skies in this area of the country here, so Toronto sitting at nine degrees, eight degrees the high in Ottawa, and Montreal also expecting a high of eight degrees tomorrow. Now, as we look to Atlantic Canada, Fredericton seeing a mix of snow and Rain looking at a high of six degrees, eight the high in Halifax, six the high in Charlottetown, looking at a chance of showers, and St. John's, Newfoundland with a high of eight degrees expected tomorrow. So there you have it, that is your forecast. Today's weather report is brought to you by Ridge Utilities, providing competitive rates for electricity, natural gas, and internet, while investing back in communities across southern Alberta. WestJet's system-wide outage over the weekend caused plenty of chaos, but has since been resolved. Officials are warning customers, however, there still may be some residual issues, disruptions, and delays as the airline works to get back up to speed. Company officials said the outage was caused by a cooling issue in its primary data center. More than 200 flights had to be cancelled. The company apologized to its customers for the inconvenience. Canada's competition watchdog told the competition tribunal that it intends to block Rogers Communications' $26 billion takeover of Shaw Communications. The ongoing hearing will aim to resolve the impasse between the Commissioner of Competition and Rogers and Shaw. It comes after weeks of talks and a short mediation period in late October that reached a stalemate. The Competition Bureau is one of the three regulatory agencies that must approve the deal before it can close. The CRTC and Innovation Science and Economic Development Canada must also give their blessings. Apple is warning customers that they may have to wait longer to get its latest iPhone models after COVID-19 restrictions were imposed on a contractor's factory in central China. The company gave no details other than to say that the factory operated by Foxconn is operating at reduced capacity. Apple says it expects lower shipments of iPhone 14 Pro and iPhone Pro Max leading to longer wait times for customers. Foxconn Technology Group says it will issue a downward revision of its fourth quarter outlook and is working on resuming full capacity. Elon Musk says Twitter will permanently suspend any account that impersonates another. The social media platform's new owner issued the warning after some celebrities changed their Twitter display names, not their account names, to Elon Musk in reaction to his decision to offer verified accounts to all newcomers for $8 a month. Comedian Kathy Griffin had her account suspended yesterday for switching her display name to Musk's. Actress Valerie Bertinelli did the same before switching it back to her real name after first posting a series of tweets in support of Democratic candidates. Now, here's a look at today's markets. The TSX was up 96 points on the day to finish at 19,545. The Dow was up 423 points to 32,827. The S&P 500 was up 36 on the day to 3,806. And the Nasdaq was up 89 points to 10,564. 
West Texas Intermediate Oil was down 82 cents to 91.79 US per barrel. Natural gas was up 54 cents to 694 US. Gold was down 12 cents to 1675.51 US an ounce. And silver was down a cent to $20.79 US an ounce. Feed wheat is at $13 per bushel, barley's at $9.90, canola's at $20.32, and corn is at $12.01 per bushel. Live cattle were up $1.40 to $1.5305. Feeder cattle January contract was up $0.30 cents to $1.7993. And lean hogs were up $4.08 to $87.05. The Canadian dollar was down slightly over the past 24 hours to $74.10 US. Recapping one of our top stories, a snowfall warning continued for Lethbridge and much of southwestern Alberta. We've seen up to 25 centimeters of the white stuff so far. A cold front has also brought us some very cold wind chill values as well, about minus 20. Environment Canada says the snow should be tapering off late Tuesday and the mercury should slowly start to climb back up to normal seasonal values by the end of the week. There's some alleged pressure on both Ukrainian President Zelensky and Russian President Putin to hold peace talks to end the war in Ukraine once and for all. Our foreign affairs expert Lisa Daftari will have details momentarily. Listen, if you see news happening in your community, be sure to drop us an email at info at bridgecitynews.ca. We'd love to hear from you. Here's today's Bridge City News community calendar. The Lethbridge Senior Citizens Organization is looking for volunteers to take part in their Drive Happiness program. This program is to help seniors in our community who are facing extreme loneliness due to lack of accessible transportation. Volunteers drive clients to their medical appointments, pick up groceries, and take them to important life activities. If you're interested in this opportunity and for more information, visit lethseniors.com slash volunteer drivers. Lethbridge Legal Guidance is a non-profit society offering free legal advice to low-income Southern Albertans. It holds clinics on Tuesdays from 4 to 6 p.m. by appointment only. Some of the areas the society assists in include family, criminal, traffic, immigration, EI, and other issues. For more information, call 403-380-6338 or visit their website, lethbridgelegalguidance.ca. And that's today's Bridge City News Community Calendar. Support for the Iranian people continues in a number of countries around the world, including right here in Canada and south of the border of the United States. Many are angry at the Islamic Republic regime and their alleged human rights abuses. To talk about this in more detail is our foreign affairs expert, Lisa Daftari, who joins us once again from Los Angeles. Lisa, not far from you in Beverly Hills, a number of Iranian Americans rallied recently showing solidarity with Iranians who are protesting the Islamic Republic and its brutal crackdowns. Many are still angry following the death of a young 22-year-old Iranian woman who allegedly died at the hands of the Islamic morality police after facing arrest for wearing her hijab incorrectly. Right, so we're entering the eighth week of protest, so two months of protest following the death of Masa Amini, the 22-year-old woman you speak of, Hal, who was showing a bit of her hair in front of her headscarf, was taken in by the morality police and died, lost her life. And since then, uh, there have been hundreds who have lost their lives on the in the protests on the streets in Iran. And thousands detained. They're actually calling for the death penalty for the peaceful protesters who have been rounded up. That would be thousands of innocent lives lost just for coming out, just for speaking out and demanding their freedom. Uh, and on the streets of Beverly Hills and Vancouver and New York and Berlin and in other places around the world, there have been solidarity protests where thousands of Iranians uh, living outside the country um, and many others who support them have come out in solidarity to show their support for the uh, Iranian protesters on the ground and uh, to say that women's lives matter, everybody's life matters, they deserve their freedom and that the regime must go. Will this make much of a difference? I mean, it's good to show that kind of solidarity, you know, how we're, we're standing in support of so many people, persecuted people in Iran, but will the regime even take notice? 
You know, it's a great question you ask. And um, actually in Canada, where you are, uh, the the pressure, the uh, raising of awareness has caused the government to do a bit of a pivot uh, and to call out the regime and to uh, forbid it, uh, the, the Revolutionary Guards family members from traveling to, from and uh, to Canada to live there, to uh, derive the benefits of living outside the country. The United States has done the same, has actually gone further further to put the Revolutionary Guard on the uh, the national terror list. Um, these are movements or actions that bring awareness, whether it's for the media or for the government, to take action to at least diminish the influence of the Iranian regime abroad. Uh, and I think these protests do a lot not just in showing solidarity, which is very important, I don't want to diminish that, but it also brings a lot of attention to um, local and national um, governing bodies to you know, take decisive action and legislation against the uh, Islamic regime in Iran, to uh, put sanctions on the regime, to step away from the Iran nuclear deal, which is what we've been asking the U.S. and its European allies to do for years now. Uh, these are all actions that will help cripple the regime, will help the people's movement go forward. And of course, as I said, the showing of solidarity with all those people who are risking their lives just to come out to tell us their stories, uh, it's, it's invaluable. The Revolutionary Guard in Iran flexed their military muscles recently by launching a new satellite-carrying rocket, Lisa. Officials say it was to demonstrate the hardline forces' prowess, even as the anti-government protests continue unabated across the country. Right, right. And in the midst of all of this, um, you can call it a distraction, or you can call it flexing of muscles to show that, uh, you know, we're still here. You know, these these protests don't mean anything to us, and they're not, um, you know, we're not in a precarious place, or they're not jeopardizing uh, our rule or reign on the country. So this is uh, obviously by design. The Islamic Republic has always done this. They do this public display to say, we're still in charge. We're still in power. We are even going to focus on our, you know, outside our borders and our, you know, uh, our growth of our weapons program or, you know, launching missiles or threatening different countries or supporting, you know, the Houthis in Yemen or Hezbollah in Lebanon. We're still here. We're still in power. This is, you know, a page from the handbook. So um, this is, you know, why it's so important to really focus on the protest, to give the, give it the, um, the headlines they deserve, give them the attention they deserve and to uh, continue putting the story in the spotlight that, that it truly deserves internationally. There's word now that Iran is seeking Russia's help to bolster its nuclear program. That's according to recent intel received by U.S. intelligence officials. Tell me more. Yeah, well, we've known that these two have been in cahoots for a long time. Uh, the previous report being that Iran had provided uh, Russia with the drones that it is currently using in Ukraine, and that recently became confirmed. Um, and now, of course, we're seeing that the Iranian regime is calling on Russia tit for tat. Now you owe us. Help us to take our weapons program forward. You know, uh, when we do isolate countries like North Korea, like Iran's regime, like Russia, like China, what we also end up doing is pushing them closer to each other because then the rogue nations of the world must find other rogue nations of the world to partner up with, to become allied with, to trade with, to buy weapons from, et cetera. So uh, we know that the short list of countries that the Iran regime is working with are Russia and China, uh, and that triangle continues. They they depend on each other um, for different favors, for, you know, each one has its own strengths and weaknesses, and they will definitely lean on one another, which is why it's so important to break up this trifecta. It's important to call it out. It's important to stop it where we can in terms of sanctions and to not allow uh, this trade to happen. Uh, we know that they have a 25-year deal, the Iranians and the Chinese, um, for trade, for oil uh, per, uh purchasing. Um, again, these this, these are the unintended consequences of putting sanctions and isolating these rogue nations. Let's circle back to the drones for just a moment here, Lisa. Iran's foreign ministry acknowledged that for the first time that Iran has in fact supplied Russia with these attack drones, the drones are being used on the Ukrainian people during the war. Now, apparently these Iranian-made drones have been dive-bombing the capital of Kyiv? 
Yes, and it's important to unpack this a bit here. Um, you know, first, Iran Mujib was denying that they were the supplying uh, the Russians with these drones. Uh, Zelensky of Ukraine said, we've actually found them. We have evidence that these are, in fact, Iran regime drones. And finally, they came around to it. I don't know if the world was waiting to hear uh, confirmation or not uh, that the Iran, the Iran regime actually acknowledged that, yes, they were supplying the drones to Russia. But again, this relationship of um, buying weapons and buying goods from one another uh, obviously makes sense. And uh, now we have the confirmation from Iran's regime. And uh, unfortunately, um, they are being bombarded into uh, Ukraine unmanned. Uh, we know that the Russians have had a tremendous number of casualties that they did not count on having, um, so much so that they are drafting and having you know Russians flee uh, at rapid speed from Russia in order not to get drafted into this senseless war. But here are all the uh, different points that we must connect in order to understand this invasion of Ukraine and how these rogue nations are playing into it as well. So, Lisa, what is the latest in the war between Ukraine and Russia? Have any peace talks been discussed between Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky and Russian President Vladimir Putin since we last spoke? I mean, the war is it now in its ninth month. Yes, and I, it's it's absolutely mind boggling the amount of or the number of lives that have been lost, the number of refugees this has created, the amount of physical um, damage and loss in Ukraine, the number of Russian uh, casualties that we have seen, and for what? Um, it's it's unbelievable. And up to now, we have not seen any public, um, you know, announcements of any peace talks. But last night, a report broke by John Solomon just news uh, saying that there are intelligence reports from the United States that uh, they are trying to pressure Ukraine's uh, Zelensky to uh, reportedly at least make it uh, look like they are working towards peace talks. They want this to come around, perhaps because we're about to have elections here this week, or um, who knows why, but they want the, uh, again, this is a report, um, so we don't have any uh, true uh, confirmation on this from either side, but um, the report says that U.S. Intel uh, says that they want the the Ukrainians to at least look like or at least come towards the idea of having peace talks. Look, it's not a bad idea, right? How um, obviously that's where we want to go. That's where we want we want to see this come to an end. Whether it's going to be Russia's call with Putin having his own off ramp and his own idea of when this will end, or world powers instead of putting billions more dollars and weapons into this awful mess, um, perhaps coming around and saying. We demand peace talks, and we demand that both sides sit down uh, to to two talks. Um, regardless, we obviously want to see this come to an end sooner rather than later. Nine months, senseless, senseless, and very, very tragic. You touched on the elections a little bit south of the border where you are right now. What's the latest in the battle between the Republicans versus the Democrats? Well, it looks like the Republicans are going to have some um, significant victories that are, will tip the uh, at least House of Representatives, maybe the Senate by a house a, a seat or two. Uh, but um, look, some people are very very happy, and some are not. But. Uh, the word here is to get out and vote. And according to many polls that we have, have looked at here at the Foreign Desk, um, it looks like crime and inflation are the two most important issues that people in the United States are voting on. As you know, here we have a major issue with both. I think that's across the board and in many countries uh, in the post-pandemic world that we live in. But um, more in, in, in larger cities here in the United States, we have a very, very serious crime issue, as we do here in Los Angeles in the very nice parts of town. We have crime problems that we never had before. And of course, inflation is affecting every American and Canadian family oh, yeah. um, in terms of buying, you know, um, food items for the holidays and heating our homes as winter approaches. I know you have snow there in Canada already. So yeah. these are important issues. And again, uh, as we all know, when these important issues hit home, that's when people start voting in a way that really will hopefully um, influence their lives and, and change it for the better. More rockets were fired into Israel from the Gaza Strip, Lisa. Fortunately, the Iron Dome aerial defense system intercepted at least one of the rockets launched from Hamas ruled Gaza, which exploded in midair. Yeah, well, thank God for the Iron Dome and thank God for the technologies that protect innocent people uh, in the Middle East and in Israel, of course, uh, against these missiles. But 
I've been drawing this line a lot in the past two months with the Iran protests going on. If you care about Israel's safety, if you care about innocent people dying from terror attacks, whether it's in Lebanon or Israel or Yemen, you know, this is why it's important to focus on the Iran uh, protests. Iran's regime is the number one state sponsor of terror. They're pouring money into Gaza and into Hamas's pockets, into Hezbollah and the Houthis' pockets, into Palestinian Islamic Jihad and more. They are the number one sponsor of suicide bombers in the world. And of course, they are terrorizing their own people on the ground in Iran. So draw all the lines back to Tehran, where the, the regime is, and um, of course, support this movement, which is a no-brainer. There's no two sides in this story. There's only one side, and it's getting rid of evil on our planet um, to stop these terror attacks and to stop the flow of money to terror organizations like uh, in Hamas in Gaza and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Britain's national broadcaster, the BBC, has apologized for its disdainful treatment of Jewish concerns or unacceptable handling of complaints about anti-Israel bias and its Arabic output. Can you explain? This is crazy. This is one of those our pigs flying moments. Um, you know, the BBC and its um, not so positive uh, spin on Israel news or Jewish uh, affairs it's a, it's a known thing. It's it's almost like it's a part of its DNA at this point, and everybody knows and accepts that. And I don't know if accept is the right word, but everyone has just, um, you know, associated the BBC with that bias. And for them to come out and say, we apologize or we, 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 we walk it back is a tremendous step. I think this is more in light of what has been going on with anti-Semitism taking such a... Um, an awful, uh, you know, increasing so much globally now among uh, celebrities and, and basketball players. And, um, you know, it's horrific. It's horrific to see this happen to the oldest religion on earth and um, to see, you know, so many people affected, yet so much silence. We had so much support for the Black Lives Matter movement. We had so much support for every um, ism uh, of, or bigotry, as we should. Uh, and of course, anti-Semitism should be on that list as well. And for the BBC to come out, it's a tremendous step. But now, the question remains, will they, in fact, change their line of reporting and their biases in the future um, to truly reflect upon this apology? So let's see. Time will tell. Yeah, time will tell. Absolutely. Our foreign affairs expert and the head of the foreign desk, Lisa Daftari, thanks so much for joining us today from Los Angeles. My pleasure. Volunteering is an important part of our community and how many local services are delivered to those in need. To talk more about the importance of volunteering in Lethbridge, Amanda Jensen joins me from Volunteer Lethbridge to tell us more about how volunteers are an integral part of our community. Amanda, thanks, you, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So first off, Amanda, can you give us a snapshot of how the Volunteer Lethbridge Association serves the community? Yeah, Volunteer Lethbridge is, is I think of it as the glue for the nonprofit sector um, for anywhere south of Calgary, really. We're the only umbrella organization that serves, serves the sector through um, help with volunteer management, which is what, what comes to mind for most people when they think about Volunteer Lethbridge, but also through... Um, you know, we're the advocates for the sector for, you know, policy or... Um, policy changes or uh, changes in law, we often are the conveners of conversations that matter to our community, such as poverty reduction or, um, you know, diversity and inclusion, et cetera. And then th the other thing that we do is we, we try to provide capacity building, training um, experiences for the sector in Lethbridge, um, you know, to, to raise all the boats. <laughs> Now uh, we talked uh, a little bit before our interview about uh, some uh, about some challenges that uh, that nonprofits are facing right now. Uh, can you tell us uh, about some of these challenges? Well, yeah, as we were saying, there's a there's a tremendous increase in in demand for services for uh, the large majority of non nonprofit organizations, which is also kept coming at a time of more scarce resources. It's probably not a surprise to hear that 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 resources are becoming more and more scarce, um, and and due to the way that uh, most uh, grant funding is set up, we really are put in a position of of you know, fighting over scraps, the pie is only so big. And so we are, um, 
we're constantly in competition with each other, um, despite the um, appropriateness or the um, the need for the mission or for the organization. So, so we're really at this yin and yang point, um, which was definitely exacerbated by the pandemic. Um, some of us um, were were fortunate to get pandemic response dollars during those years from various levels of government, and and those programs you'll see many of those programs that were working and were built up during that time due to the extra influx of cash um, are now closing because the the, the dollars just weren't um, sustainable. And we talked about uh, inflation, which is a hot button issue. Uh... Uh, all across Canada, uh, how is that impacting nonprofits? Well, it's 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 impacting us because um, money is scarce. So you know what what we're looking for is investment from from the business community, from various levels of government, but also from our neighbors into missions that that matter to us. Whether it's you know whether cancer has touched your life and it's cancer research or it's food banks, etc. Um, and and w- when our basic needs are so hard to meet right now, the first thing that has to go are things that are not going to contribute to your immediate, you know, survival. Mm-hmm. The other way that it, um, you know, the, the the idea of scarcity and tough times affect uh, uh, a volunteer center or a community. Let's make it broader, a community, is um, we don't have time. We are often stuck in working um, more than one job, um, as you mentioned before, potentially doing a, a gig job to try to, you know, to to bring up the the income to af- afford the groceries that have now, you know, escalated in cost. So there's no time for a person to contribute to their community, to volunteer, to become involved in 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 government in any way, to to shovel a neighbor's walk, et cetera. So all of those things are lost when we are living in this um, you know this in scarcity. and And what can volunteers do to to help with these challenges? Well, I mean, we we volunteer. Uh, we recognize volunteers as, as as really the solution to helping nonprofit organizations with their human resource costs and to keep their human resource costs down, but also to uh, to bring different experiences, different um, perspectives um, uh, to an organization that that may not exist there through paid employment. But what volunteering also does on the on the other side of of things is it's it's a mutually beneficial relationship for the nonprofit organization and for the volunteer. I know when I volunteer, um, I I feel better about myself. I feel more connected to my community. I feel I'm gaining experiences that I'll be able to use again in another situation. There's so many reasons to volunteer. So. Um, you know, it, it is so mutually beneficial to both the nonprofit organization and the pers- person serving. I know I've had a lot of fun uh, doing volunteering, and it's just it, it, it's it's so rewarding. And then plus, you're you're you're, you're helping out like a, a, a very worthy cause uh, when when you're doing it. Uh, Amanda, can you walk us through the process of how one might become a volunteer? Yes, I can. And it's changed. Volunteer Lethbridge has really changed its operating model almost 180 uh, degrees since um, since the beginning of the pandemic, just out of necess- necessity and trying to meet people where they're at. So um, how it, a volunteer center traditionally runs is, you know, what we think of is, you know, we post opportunities and 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 make them available to the community and a, a volunteer, a potential volunteer then gets in touch with the organization and, and uh, you know, a match is made. But what that didn't allow was for us as a volunteer center to actually know what was happening in between whether matches were made, how they went, whether it was a good fit, what the turnover is, et cetera. So we are now um, centralizing, I suppose, um, I would call it volunteerism in our community so that we do become the organization that not only does the uh, promotion of opportunities, but we meet with people to try to, you know, increase the probability of a successful volunteer relationship with a nonprofit organization based on what they bring to the table, how much time they have, their experience, et cetera. But then we take this one step further where we're screening them as well. And screening is something that we don't talk about enough, I think, when we're talking about volunteerism, is making sure that the volunteer is going to be safe um, in the in their chosen role and that the constituents that they're serving, the organization themselves, are going to be safe bringing this person into their organization. So that's a major change that we've made is, is taking that step 
um, so that it frees up the volunteer manager's time on the other end. So by the time the volunteer arrives at their door, they're ready to be um, trained and onboarded. And you talked about uh, matching volunteers with uh, with with uh, organizations. Can someone request to volunteer for a specific charity? Absolutely. We do have people who come and they know exactly what they want to do. Um, they know they want to work uh, weekends with you know, the shelter, whatever it is, right? We just um, take away the administration then from that nonprofit organization so that all of those admin costs and, and whatever screening is necessary is done by the time they get there. But then we can also be, you know, that great person to, you know, bounce ideas off of too. And, you know, some volunteer opportunities we would never know exist that are just um, very unique and and sort of under the, under the surface. So, this, this model also, I have to mention, allows for much freer movement of the volunteer in the community. So once they've been screened through Volunteer Lethbridge um, and want to try another volunteer opportunity, they can then go to that organization and show you know, the proof of screening from Volunteer Lethbridge and all of that administration that would normally have to be doubled and happened again, happen again, excuse me, is, is done. Oh, okay, um, and you wow. can also um, imagine the, um, the stress that is put on the Lethbridge Police Service or RCMP to continually be doing these right, uh, yeah. criminal record checks that we are removing all of that duplication. Well, that, that sounds very efficient. And then, so how long does the application process take? It can be really, it can be really quick. Um, really, the only thing that we are um, a bit stymied by is the length of time for uh, a police information check to be returned. Um, it's it, it's taking about a month right now for that to happen, just administratively on the on the police services side. I know they're doing the best that they can, um, but that is for positions that that require that level of screening. There are um, many other positions that are, you know, work a casino for your, your charity or, you know, uh, dishwash at this, at this, you know, gala event or sell tickets or whatever. Those sorts of things can happen pretty quickly, pretty immediately because the level of risk is so low for them to be, you know, entering into that, into that uh, relationship with the nonprofit. So it really depends on the, the type of position that one is applying for. And what about the family? Can a whole family work together as volunteers in an, or in an organization? Absolutely. What a beautiful thing to do together. Um, you know, I've, we've spent a couple of Saturdays, my family, with, um, with the YWCA and the Lethbridge Food Bank in uh, preparing meals for uh, their clientele and freezer meals. And so my kids are learning, and me, learning how to use a knife properly, learning how to cut, listening to music, just spending time together. And then we have this product at the end of the morning. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful activity. And then there's plenty of others just like it. And uh, how is Volunteer Lethbridge funded? Where, 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 where did the funds come from? We get, um, most of our funding is provincial at the moment through two operating grants. Um, the rest we, you know, as an executive director, a lot of my time is spent looking for more opportunities, looking for grants, looking for programs that might fit. Sometimes we have to do that in order to, to bring new monies in. Um, and then fundraising events and, and uh, um, you know, gifts from, from individuals who, who believe in our mission. Uh, we are a member-driven organization, so we do have, um, you know, small income from memberships. So at any given time, we have between 100 and 100, 150 nonprofit organizations that are um, are paying to, um, to use our services. And uh, who are some of the org organizations that Volunteer Lethbridge works with? Volunteer Lethbridge is uh, in a very unique position in that we, um, we are the capacity builders for other nonprofits that span the spectrum of uh, age, uh, you know, um, whether it's sport, whether it's art, um, theater, social services, etc. We we are blessed in that we can we can serve the whole swath of of nonprofit organizations in the community and really be representative of. Um, of the opportunities that are out there for, for the various interests that people have. So uh, we're in a unique position in that um, we're not doing the work, but we get to support that, that work that's happening in the community across all, all, all parts of the nonprofit world.
Great. And uh, what are some challenges right now that the people of Lethbridge can help with? Oh, my. Um, there's so, let's call them opportunities. <laughs> there are so many opportunities. I mean, I, I often think of um, the difficulty that the um, arts and culture sector had during the pandemic. They were hit tremendously hard, as you can well imagine. Yes, yes. Um, and are now trying to 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 come out of that and and, and see if it's going to return to you know pre-pandemic levels. But um, I would say an, an easy thing to do would be to support art and culture, uh, sell tickets, sell merchandise, um, put up posters, buy tickets to events, um, gift gift things like that rather than you know something from you know a big box store that sort of thing coach a you know a sports team like those are you know more formal volunteer opportunities but you know what we don't capture through this organization and and, and probably can't is what happens with you know you know you haven't seen your neighbor in a few days and knocking on the door or shoveling the walk or taking a meal etc there are so many ways that we serve that are unnoticed or, you know, don't have this process behind it that we're talking about. So there's innumerable, innumerable ways to get involved. And Amanda, I'm going to give you an opportunity to brag a bit. Can you tell us some of the successes Volunteer Lethbridge has had over the years? Oh, yes, I can. Um, I've only been here since the beginning of the pandemic, but I can tell you that the former executive directors built up an incredible organization that is very trusted by the community. I can tell you since I've been here, um, changing that operating model is, is, is I can't overstate what a, a big deal it is in terms of providing better service to the volunteers, better service to our nonprofit organizations and therefore the community. And I will say that, that this operating model is being watched very closely by um, provincial counterparts and, um, and federal counterparts to see how it works. And so I do expect the next couple of years with this organization to be to continue to be revolutionary, to um, to be a leader and a wayfinder um, for the sector that you know specifically serves volunteers. So it's a really exciting time to be here. Um, also really um, believe so strongly in how technology can make make our lives easier and make the connections between nonprofits and and potential volunteers in its community um, more accessible. And so I think that there's there's going to be a lot of interesting things that that unfold over the next while. Well, Amanda, unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. You as well. That was Amanda Jensen with Volunteer Lethbridge. I'm Naveen Day, and on behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News, thanks for watching.